finally, I'm going to talk about where we can go from here and demonstrate in the field. All right, so the why and the what. Well, if you've ever programmed in FTC, then you've probably had the issue of managing two things at once. Let's say you want to update two subsystems or you want driver control to run at the same time as automation. It can be pretty hard to do those things without a state machine, and state machines just simplify those tasks a lot. State machines are an integral part of programming and not just FTC, but the industry as well. And you'll find that if you implement them, your life will be a lot easier for these tasks. And today I'm going to be explaining what a state machine is, how to implement a powerful one with hash maps, and demonstrate their power in real time. So what is a state machine? Well, a state machine is a sequential model of computation. That might just sound like random words, but what a model of computation is, is it's a model that tells you what output will be calculated per a given input. And basically what a fixed state machine describes is what a system is going to do. Um, there are certain inputs, as you can see, if they're satisfied, it will transition states. And in addition, finite state machines can be deterministic or non-deterministic. In general, a deterministic algorithm is one where per a given input, you only have one output, or the output is the same. Whereas a non-deterministic one, you can have different outputs per the input. So in the context of a state machine, that means that with a deterministic state machine, you can be in one state at a time, you can transition to one state at a time, whereas in a non-deterministic one, you can be in and transition to multiple states. For the purposes of FTC, all you need to know are deterministic state machines. That's what I'm gonna focus on today. So for example, um, take this state machine right here. The initial state is the game running state. And if this input condition is satisfied, then it will move on to the game pause state, this input condition is satisfied, it will move on to the game running state. Um, the same thing kind of happens on the left side. So how can we make a state machine? Well, first we need some variable to keep track of what state our state machine is in. And then you saw in the previous slide that we need to keep on checking if a certain input condition is satisfied, so we need some sort of loop. And within this loop, um, we pretty much need to be checking what state we're in and when to transition. There are many ways to do this, but one example, you can create a switch statement for your current state, and for the case of your current state, you can execute any actions you need to and check any conditions you need to. So if these conditions return true, then you can move on to the next state, and you can repeat this for as many states as you want. And in the previous slide, I talked about the variable being some arbitrary data type, but a good data type to use is the enum. In Java, enums basically just sort of special constant objects um, they're very good for describing things with readable syntax. And for the purposes of this state machine, I'm going to be using enums to describe each state. For example, the arm enum enum here it describes all the states that an arm can be in. That's kind of what I'm going to be doing. So in the pr um, previously, I showed you guys a pseudocode state machine. But this one's pretty bad. You can see that it's not really clear what we're doing. There's just a bunch of cases, breaks, states. And it's hard to repeat because, you know, you have to rewrite the switch and the loop is kind of like um, not very specific. And it can easily lead to bugs um, unless you're very, very sure of what you're doing. <coughs> so what would an actually good state machine look like? The code might look like this. As you can see, it's really obvious what we're doing. Boom, we added an action, we added a condition, we added another action. Really easy to repeat this. Every function only has, pretty much only has another function as a parameter. So when you write code like this, it's really easy for people to understand what you're doing, including yourself. But how can we create this? Well, can you try to put the slide here? Come on, Casey, I memorized that one already. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, so pretty much what we need to do is we need a state machine class oh, wait, to handle. Can I just quickly interrupt? By the way, so I'm recording this. This will be published on YouTube. Yeah. So Thank like, you. You can take pictures if you want, but I am recording this, and you can find this online later. Yeah, so pretty much what we need to do is we need a state machine class that will handle everything for us. We can have an update function that will update everything. We can have an add action function that will add whatever we need. And we also need some way to store all of our actions and conditions. So what we can do is we can map these enums, which are just states, and then map them to a condition or an action. And within our update function, we can simply loop through all of these maps and then execute any actions we need to, check any conditions we need to, and you know if the condition returns true, we can move to another state. 
If we need more details, for example, you only want it to execute a certain amount of times, you can just add more data to your maps. So in order to actually map these things, we can use Java's generic map interface, but the map interface itself has a lot of separate classes. So for example, there is the hash map class. Um, it computes hash codes and two keys. Um, basically what it does is it allows them it to look up keys and values in constant time, so it's really fast. And the hash map is generally like kind of industry standard for maps. The one downside that it has is it consumes a lot of memory. Then we have the tree map. Um, it stores a tree of nodes containing your keys and values, utilizes binary search, which means that it has a logarithmic O log n lookup and insertion time. Basically, what this means is it's slower than a hash map, but it also consumes less memory. And the final map I'm going to be talking about is the linked hash map. It's essentially a hash map that uses a doubly linked list to store all of its values instead of an array. This means that its keys are ordered and so are its values, but it also means that it consumes a lot more memory. So which one do we actually want to use for FTC? Well, in practice here, we don't really need that much memory. We aren't storing a ton of data. So the tree map isn't that important. It doesn't offer many advantages. On the other hand, when we design FTC, what we really need is a very fast update time. Because when you have things like pose control and odometry, and later we'll talk about Kalman filtering in a later presentation, you really want your update time to be really fast so you can have almost real time um, corrections. So we want to use some sort of hash map due to its constant lookup time and insertion time. Um, so we have a linked hash map and a hash map to choose from. Which one do we want? Well, in the practice of a state machine, we don't need ordered keys because we're going to be looking for a certain key, but we're not going to be looking for them chronologically, so it doesn't matter. And same thing for the values. We don't need them to be ordered because we can just store them in another data type like an array, um, which will order them regardless. So the best option we can have is just to use a hash map. So if you wanted to write these classes yourself, you might use something like this. So you can see that our D3 hash map, um, it contains some state as a key, and then it contains um, an array list of your actions. If you want more details, you can put two things in your array list. You can put three things in, a, in your array list, and ultimately, it's the D5 hash map, which is what I used, is basically just this. You have your state, and then each state has several, you know, several actions and other data within it. Okay, so previously I showed you the good implementation of a state machine. We were passing functions as parameters. So how can we do that? Well, we need to use Java's functional interface. Java's functional interface provides a way to pass functions into your methods for our state machine class. And I'm gonna be using two. One is the runnable interface. So this interface takes no parameters and returns no value. Then we have the supplier um, <coughs> interface, which has no parameters and some return value. You can see here that this supplier right here, it's a Boolean supplier, it just returns false, but you can return whatever you want, whatever Boolean you want. Um, and pretty much what I'm gonna be doing is, if that supplier returns true, then we transition to the next state. Um, here's some examples of using runnables. So this is our runnable here, and then we just call dot run to run it. This is our supplier, and we call dot get to get its value. Okay, and in order to actually pass the functions, a good thing we can use um, our Java's lambda and method reference syntaxes. So these were things introduced in Java 1.8, and they let you pass functions without having to like create a new function object, something inconvenient like that. These are basically anonymous functions that don't really belong to any class, like this one right here, just parentheses, so no parameters and it executes the statement right here, which basically just makes it follow a trajectory. Um, then there's met method references, which are just lambdas that refer to an existing method. So you don't have to write a new one. For example, let's say we had a class that already, let's say our chassis class already had a follow trajectory function. Instead of having to write this, we can just write like chassis colon colon follow trajectory async. It's just a more concise way to write your functions. An example here, uh, your example class has a function called print string that just prints its input. And you can see we reference it here instead of having to use the lambda syntax. Okay, so I discussed all these things and to tie them up together, we can write some functions in our state machine class. Might look something like this. And 
you might notice that all of them return this. This just stands for the state machine object itself. So what we can do with this is your function returns the state machine object. So in instead of having to call your object every time you want to run a function, you can just call the function on the output of another function. It's called method chaining, and it makes the syntax a lot better. So what the final update function would look like, we have our transition action maps. These are actions that execute when we're transitioning between states. These are our before action maps. They run before conditions are checked every time we loop through update. This might include things like updating your chassis or your PID control. Then we have um, our condition map. We check all the conditions. If they return true, then we will break out of the update function and basically transition to the next state. And we also have our after action map. These are functions that might not necessarily have to be executed um, regardless. So if your condition returns true, these won't execute. And the final file is about 1,300 lines when you method overload it. So it's not very long. You could write it yourself if you wanted. It's mostly just method overloading. All right, so where can we go from here? This state machine, it's pretty good, but there are a lot of improvements that you can still make to it. For example, you can create some sort of state machine data type, maybe a state machine action or a state machine sequence. So that you could transfer state machines between files, something like that. Um, you could also run it on a separate thread asynchronous execution. And you could also resign it with a different system so that instead of hash maps, you're using something like an action queue. And finally, you could do more method overloading and bashing so that you can just have infinite possibilities for how you actually want to pass your, uh, how you actually want to use your functions. Okay, so before I take questions, I think I'll just demonstrate this. So this is the op mode that I'm gonna be demonstrating. The entire op mode is less than 50 lines long. It's basically just gonna drive forward, wait until something's intake, deliver the freight with the turret. Um, fields over here. It's going to be in the going forward state. It's going to drive forward. And once it's reached its destination, it's pretty much going to wait for a freight to intake. And once that returns true, we move to the backward state. Then we outtake it. It's going to wait again. It's in the backward state. And now it's done. So it's kind of like. <laughs> in under 50 lines. So it's really easy to write uh, code with this, and you could also use it for teleop if you wanted. And here are some additional resources that you can reference um, if you want to learn more about state machines, <laughs> lambdas, hash maps, that kind of stuff. Oh, it's on the Any questions that you have now? 
I have a question, but I'm not sure how to ask it. So if it doesn't make sense, yeah, we'll skip it. We'll talk about it later. Uh, 7172 uses the state machine in class year two. We have the ability to change the order of the states depending on what we were doing. So for example, 